Okay. Um, so Sunshine noted that I was um, the Trust of Atlantic City's recovery reporter for Hurricane Sandy. And when Harvey was uh, in the middle of Harvey, actually, um, I actually emailed Sunshine uh, going, you know what? There are a lot of reporters who are going to be thrown into that situation uh, pretty much the same way that I was. And they may not have any idea of what they're about to walk into in that, um, you know, covering disasters at a more localized level is a little bit different than when you cover it at a very large level. So um, it, it's a different process than I was immediately trying to think about how could we transfer some of that information and knowledge that a Sandy recovery reporters knew um, and gained on the job and, and had to go on the fly very much. Um, and how can we make it easier for the recovery, the reporters covering recovery throughout the country um, now? Um, and so that's why we came up with these two workshops, these two webinars. And um, the first one is, is really kind of about the, the initial stages, and I'm going to touch a little bit about uh, flood insurance, um, because I know that that's a really hot topic and a lot of folks uh, want to know about it. Um, but um, primarily, I'm just introducing what what you're going to be doing and giving you a lot of tips of things that I learned on the job. And I'm giving this from the perspective of what I learned as a reporter, not from anything else um, that I'm doing. Um, but I just wanted to be able to transfer that knowledge to some of the other reporters out there to help make their jobs a little bit easier. Um, and so a little bit uh, first, um, I just want to go over some of the goals of this is obviously sharing my lessons learned uh, during Sandy recovery. Um, but also kind of help you uh, as reporters is particularly understand some of the recovery landscape. And I'm not going into this super detailed. If you're a policy expert, you may already know a lot of this. Um, but if you're, you're somebody who's new to the recovery beat, you probably don't know much of this at all. Um, but then I also want to help you understand a little bit about what the data is out there that's easy to get and some of the challenges of, of being able to use data in terms of um, helping your helping inform your reporting and then most of all I want to help you identify some of the de most important details to make sure you incorporate in your stories because a lot of times you're going to have uh, process stories that your editors or your producers may not be too fond of but those are the things that your readers really need and, and I'm going to share some of the things that I learned um, in my work to, to help uh, you see like maybe things that you ordinarily wouldn't be using as a story may actually be one of your most important stories so um, First, I just you know, quick thing. Um, as such, I noted I, I used to be at the Press of Atlantic City. Um, I uh, during uh, as we were dealing with recovery, I was lucky enough to be an annual workshop for journalists uh, attendee uh, fellow, and I unfortunately left journalism uh, not long after that to go back to graduate school to study public policy and urban planning with a focus on climate adaptation and coastal resilience work. But most importantly, I focused on stakeholder engagement and risk communication because that the, the experience of covering Sandy really taught me that a lot of the communication challenges that are on the ground are there because a lot of folks just don't know how to talk to each other. And I felt that that was something that I would be able to help out with. Um, but at the same time, I also like to take all of what I've learned to help bring that back to reporters because it's really important for you guys to know how to work with some of this and understand this so that you can make your work resonate with, with uh, your readers and your, your viewers. Um, so first, I just want to go over a very short overview of the stages of recovery. And this is not anything formal, but this is just stuff that I've, I've uh, noticed um, in my observations. And that first stage is really that humanitarian relief. And that's getting people uh, safe, uh, you know, out of, out of dangerous way, um, getting them the basic needs and their basic food met, um, and possibly you know, giving them a place to sleep initially. Um, the next stage is, is the short term, what I call the short term recovery. And that's really kind of the beginning that cleanup. And that lasts for a couple of months, uh, possibly longer, depending on where you're at. And that's, you know, cleaning out the flood damaged houses, that's removing debris, that's cleaning up infrastructure and getting things starting to operate again. Um, and that's a stage that we're still in, in, in terms of Texas. And I think we're finally there uh, in, in Florida, perhaps. Um, but I know that they're still trying to restore power in some areas. And then the third stage is the long-term recovery, and that's where you're getting your really deep rebuilding going on. And that I'm going to focus on much more deeply on Friday's webinar, um, because that's a very big process, and that's actually where you as a reporter can be the most valuable, because you can help people start understanding that process. It's not simple. Um, so um, first, I just want to cover a little bit overview of what FEMA does in, in terms of you know, their role in disaster recovery. Um, and the first thing I want to note is that disaster recovery is, is always much more complicated, much more chaotic, and much more complex than people want it to be. It also takes a lot longer than people want it to be. 
because your life is disrupted and you want to go back to normal right now. Um, and FEMA is really trying to help you do that, as well as all the other government agencies that are working with FEMA and all of the volunteer organizations that are working with FEMA and the other disaster recovery groups. Um, and so FEMA really comes in uh, during this to connect folks to public assistance and, and different types of assistance to help them get back on their feet initially. Um, and, and how did they work? Uh, when you have a major disaster, they have to bring a lot of people into the area right away. And so they have this reservist uh, group um, where they have people who this is their job. They get called up when there's a major disaster and they come from all over the country and they come to, to basically start putting things together and being the boots on the ground to make those first initial steps and doing that initial getting folks registered, helping people understand what things are, what, what's available and how to connect them to initial relief. Um, and it's uh, one thing that's important for you all as reporters to understand is that a lot of this is through, uh, the policy that this is through is through the Stafford Act. And so one thing I would recommend is to go look that up and read a little bit more about that and understand what, how the, how, what kind of limitations that places on uh, the government and what they can actually offer. Um, and so the thing is that FEMA, Congress never really intended for FEMA to be an, in, an insurance agency. It's not uh, an insurance program. It's not going, the assistance that they provide is not going to make people whole. Um, and people who have insurance may not get any kind of disaster benefit through FEMA at all. Um, they really look at that through what kind of um, income you have and what kind of uh, other capacity that you have to be able to, to rebuild and recover. Um, and so a couple of the individual assistance type programs and, and grants include the, the food stamps program, the, the, I think it's called DSNAP, which is Disaster uh, or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, and then Transitional Sheltering Assistance, which is getting people into a safe, sanitary, and secure housing um, for a temporary time while they find something that's more permanent uh, or they are able to fix and repair their home. Um, it does not cover much, and I think the, you, you would need to verify this, but I think the most amount of money that FEMA can actually offer somebody is, is $33,000, which really isn't very much money at all. But the most common, you know, typical amount is usually about $4,000. So uh, make sure that when you are talking about this and, and working on this, that you verify that, that amount with, with whoever you're working with, with FEMA and, and other organizations, because uh, that things might have changed. Um, but it's important to actually understand that they don't offer very much money, but what they do offer uh, can, is very, that depends on your income. Um, the next, if you don't qualify for a lot of that assistance, or even if you do, they will offer loans through the Small Business Administration. And um, that depends on a lot of stuff. And I found that when I was working and covering this beat, uh, that a lot of people were really upset when they got offered loans because they, they tend to just want everything to be fixed for them. So. Um, it's important to, to kind of you know, navigate that process and describe that process and how it works and why it exists in the first place. So, so and then the third one that is going to become really big, um, especially in terms of long-term recovery, is, this, is the community development block grants uh, that might be coming. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen. It's still relatively early in the process. I know that there was the $8 billion supplemental that was passed um, a couple, I think it was actually last week or maybe even the week before. Um, and so the question is, right now as they're assessing how much the need really is in both uh, Texas and in Florida, um, Congress may or may not pass another one. And so that's something for reporters to really watch and to really be careful about uh, what's happening because uh, after Sandy, uh, there, it did not actually get passed until January and Sandy happened at the end of October. Um, but when that uh, bill passed, there suddenly was a very large um, effort to try to figure out where that money was going and the states actually have a great deal of, of input for how that money is ultimately spent and, trans and, and brought down to the ground and, and how those recovery processes and programs begin. So, um, and I'll talk about that a lot more on Friday. So, um, what do your readers need to know? That's one of the most important things to keep asking yourself as you're covering this. Um, and and th these are four things that I really learned um, as I was as I, as I was covering Sandy, and that, you know, disaster recovery is stressful, and it's, it's it, the longer it goes on, the more difficult it is for people to begin to navigate the bureaucracy, because they've never been exposed to it before, even though it exists for a reason. Um, and so for reporters, what you can really do is provide information, and that, one of the things that I learned that what still sticks with me is just how valuable it is to have somebody provide information that is relevant to them, 
and, and is able, people are able to understand. So if you're able to translate um, a lot of really complicated stuff and, and complicated policy to folks who are in crisis, you will be incredibly valuable to them. And so one of the first things is to help them find assistance that is relevant to them. And that might be, um, uh, you know, the number to, the, you know, the, the 800 number to FEMA's assistance group um, or, or call center may not be the most relevant number for folks. Um, and, and that, uh, trying to figure out how to get through numbers and get through information to folks that, that they can apply to their particular situation. Um, the next one is if things change, people need to know why and what they can do. And by that I mean, uh, if, you know, in, in New Jersey and in New York, um, after Sandy, folks were required to rebuild their houses if they met a certain threshold um, to the, no, the newest uh, flood, uh, base flood elevation, which meant a lot of houses had to be elevated. And that was something that was a really chaotic and complicated time for a lot of people because they just didn't understand what that meant and why, and then they got overwhelmed trying to think about how to actually do it and pay for it. Um, so if, if people are required to, to upgrade to, you know, rebuild their house to meet new building codes, um, make sure that people understand why and how that actually is to occur and what they can do about it. Um, the third thing that I found was that people who were not in you know, areas that got damaged they want to know how they can help people. And so even if you've already run a story, keep running those stories. They may seem repetitious, but um, those will be the stories that people cut out and, and send to each other and say, okay, this is what I'm going to keep and what I'm going to use because this has phone numbers for how I can help and even places I can go to provide volunteer time. Um, in terms of, you know, also finding assistance that people are, is relevant to them, one thing that I found was that um, just the printed product became so much more valuable because there are a lot of people who don't actually have computers and don't know how to use the internet. And when you have disaster, people get displaced, especially people who are poor and people who are uh, elderly. And those people are the most vulnerable and those people are the ones who really read the paper because the paper has information that they can use. And in fact, I actually got, uh, people would cut out articles and send them to other people in states far away from New Jersey and then I would actually get a letter from people in, in states far away of Iowa um, who had been given those, who had had that mailed to them, and that their only connection to what was going on where their home was was their friend sending them these letters, and that they would ask me to write back because they didn't necessarily know how to call me or, or how to, to email me because they didn't use a computer. Um, so I found that the, the, the value of a printed product just became so much higher than I initially thought. So if you can always put it in the paper, if you have a printed product, definitely make sure that that information goes in there. And then finally, um, working phone numbers that reach knowledgeable people, not necessarily a phone tree. People in crisis really struggle with dealing with the phone trees and trying to navigate um, voicemail or navigate um, uh, ro you know, robotic voices. And if you can provide phone numbers that go directly to a human being that can help them answer those, their questions, that will be really helpful, even if it's your local board, your local zoning code um, official or your local, um, you know, your local town engineer that can really help them. If, you know, obviously verify that that's okay with, with who you're working with, but, but definitely provide those phone numbers and keep providing them. In fact, I used to joke, I could put it four or five places in the store in a sidebar in, in, in the tagline, and, and I would still get a call from somebody asking me where the phone number was. So just be aware that that's probably going to happen. Um, the, next, uh, the next stage, I want, next thing I want to talk about briefly, this is, no, there we go. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about very briefly is just the NFIP, um, the National Flood Insurance Program, just because I know that a lot of folks are starting to get a, a pretty intense introduction to this. Um, and, and that, the, the NFIP is really um, something that I could talk about for probably a day, but there are also better people to talk about it with. Um, but I just want to go over it very quickly, and that is, um, you know, as you know, that flood insurance in the United States is primarily provided through the federal government, and it was a program created in uh, 1968 um, as a response to a number of floods that really ruined a lot of folks financially. Um, and it was designed as a way to help people um, you know, recover from storms without having to, you know, dip into money that they didn't have. And unfortunately, it did create the, uh, the, the, hazard, the side effect of just, you know, people suddenly were building in flood zones that they didn't necessarily expect to be building in. Um, but unfortunately, that's how we are right now. 
Um, and there was a lot of changes going on at, at, the, at the at the federal level in trying to figure out how to reauthorize the bill and how to re, how to change the program to be more um, fiscally sound. Um, but primarily, if you are in a house um, or have a property that is mapped into a flood in, flood zone that is according to the flood insurance rate map, um, you have to have flood insurance if you have a federally backed mortgage. Not everybody has a federally backed mortgage and not everybody has a mortgage. So not everybody has flood insurance. And if you are in an area that flooded and you're not in a flood zone, you're not required to have flood insurance. And so we're seeing a lot of folks in Texas, obviously, that don't have flood insurance because they never were required to have it in the first place. Um, so uh, how to follow the data with this? Well, um, that's complicated. And if you simply Google policy and claim statistics for flood insurance, that will take you to the easiest available data that FEMA has on their website. The challenges with this, not this data is that um, there, there's a, a number of them. Um, first, I know that we all want to have the, this finest level of data that we can possibly get, the parcel level data, but there's a federal law that prohibits what's called personally identifiable information. And that means that if information can be connected to somebody you know, personally, it can't be released without their consent. And so they have to be very careful with how they release the data because there might be only one house in a census block or one house in, in a, um, a census tract that is in a flood zone. And so somebody can identify that house right away. Um, so they generally, the finest level of data that's available online is at the, the municipality level. And it's not corrected. It's not uh, anal it's, it's just a cumulative amount of how much that has, how many lawsuits have been filed. And so it's challenging to find the context in that. And so if you're a reporter, I really highly recommend that you connect with your state floodplain manager association or the American, uh, the, the federal, the, the national uh, association for floodplain managers. Um, they are really, really great sources and they're very happy to talk to you and help you understand this data. And they might even be able to help you uh, get better data that you can use because they may have it at the state level that's more, more um, available to, to you than maybe at the federal level. Um, when it comes to recovery, um, FEMA will usually release key recovery numbers for each um, type of disaster on a monthly basis. Uh, initially, it might even be a weekly basis. Um, that's usually released by email, and then for the large events, they'll actually have a, a specific website for those um, particular storms. And so I checked FEMA, and I didn't see it. I checked the website today, and I didn't see a, a website yet created for Irma or for Harvey. Um, it's thought it's still really early. It's only been a few weeks. Um, but that will gradually become available, and that's where a lot of information will be posted, and you can use that data uh, to help provide some context. It's not the greatest of data. It's not the greatest um, of information to provide the best context. So I definitely highly recommend calling and talking to the PIOs about how to get more information. But then also talking to you know people at the state level who are working with FEMA to see what kind of context they can provide because the, the PIOs, as good as they are, may not actually have that information handy. Um, additionally, uh, another tip is that the PIOs for disaster specifically that are specifically assigned to disasters will most likely rotate in around because they're generally brought in on a disaster basis. And so as you get to know them, find out when they're leaving and so you can get the information for the new person coming in. That was something that we had a lot of trouble with initially, just trying to understand that that was going to happen. So um, if you don't already know that, that's something to know that, you know, when you are covering a major disaster, your PIO is going to change relatively frequently. Um, and then one more piece that I want to, to share in terms of data that's really important to understand is uh, the recovery contracts. And that, you know, there's, there's a short-term recovery contract that's like the debris removal and the initial cleanup. Um, and those folks are, uh, it's, it's, I don't know how the public records will work in, like, in Texas or in Florida, but you can use those public records to find that information. Um, the thing with the recovery contracts is that a lot of times the, the companies that are doing this uh, may be considered politically connected um, or they may seem like they're getting a lot of contracts. Well, it's because they also do this work. That's like all they do. And so what's really important to look at when you are examining this is whether or not the company has um, the capacity to do the job. And I've seen stories in various disasters about recovery contracts uh, that seemed like they were um, a little bit uh, interesting in terms of the numbers, but in actuality, it really wasn't that big of a deal. 
while they missed the fact that this other company that also got a contract uh, didn't have the ability to even do the job. So kind of look at that context for do they have the capacity to do the job? Can they do the job? Um, and use that as one of your benchmarks for how you're looking at those contracts. So um, next I want to just give you a couple of really essential, simple essential tips uh, for me. Uh, it was essential to stay organized. I know that every reporter has their own way of managing things and staying organized. Um, it's going to become much more intense than you've probably ever imagined. So you may have to alter that process. Uh, something that really helped me was to know key dates for recovery and put them on my calendar. When were reports supposed to be released? When were contracts supposed to be due? Um, and just kind of plan that coverage around those dates to, because things are going to change rapidly and you may not always be the first one to know. So if you have really good sourcing, you know, definitely build that sourcing in, especially off the record or on background, so you just know how to anticipate what's going to happen. Um, what was essential for me to keep my head slightly above water, and I'm not going to say it was really very high above water, um, was to plan the coverage as much as I could, because there's a lot of enterprise stories that you want to do, and there's a lot of really important enterprise stories that does really help people, um, and you want to plan that, you want to make sure you have time for that, you're not always getting caught off guard by the breaking news, because they're always going to release everything at 5 o'clock um, without somebody available, they just always do. Um, and so, if you can anticipate that happening, it will keep you from working 16-hour uh, days, which there were many of those I did. So um, another really important tip is just, you know, find time to take off. Make sure you do take time off because if you don't, you're going to burn out and you're going to have tr difficulty just managing all of the workload, even if you are, have people that are on a team working on it together. Um, so definitely make sure that you give, your time, you give yourself time to debrief and relax a little bit. Um, and then one thing that was probably the most useful thing I ever did was I kept a list of uh, key service phone numbers um, on my desk. And that by, the, by that, by key service, I mean like uh, every number to every possible program that the state was offering and it just kept getting longer and longer and longer because no matter how many times I put those numbers in the, phone, in the paper or on the website, people were still calling me to get that information. Uh, and at one point I had a voicemail message that lasted three minutes long because I kept it in my voicemail too. So um, just know that people are not necessarily able to think through things as well as you might want them to, but you can actually provide that connection and that information and that you will become one of those people that is providing the central public service as you're going through this. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sarah. Um, that was great. Um, and so we're happy to take questions now um, uh, while we're... Um, as people start sending them in, I have a couple for you right at the top. There were a couple of organizations you mentioned um, that you would recommend using as sources, and it, it was a little bit hard to hear. Could you say okay. those again? Um, your State Floodplain Managers Association. Um, there is one for Texas and there is one for Florida. Um, connect with them. They can connect you with people who really know this information in and out. Um, not just from a flood insurance perspective or a protection perspective, but also just how recovery will work. Um, and those people um, are, they still are some of my best information sources. And even though I'm no longer a journalist, I still call them and just ask them questions. And they're very happy to share that information. And a great place to start if you don't know who your state floodplain manager association folks are, um, the association for state State Floodplain Managers um, is the national uh, organization, and they are incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly helpful, incredibly happy to help talk to you and provide context and provide information. Um, so here's another question that came in. Um, this is um, someone asking, as a, a middleman, quote unquote, such as Sea Grant, that may have related information, what's the best way to get that out to reporters? That's a really good question um, because I, I spend a lot of time dealing with dis message dissemination because that's one of the hardest things to do and the reporters really are the best at doing that. Cultivate, re cultivate relationships with the reporters. Um, while press releases get to a lot of folks on social media, um, a lot of times people are going to ignore those press releases if they have 300 emails in their inbox. So, Cultivate those relationships and call them and then put as much information as you can in the press release that you're going to send out. Each reporter wants their information differently. And so knowing who they are and knowing what they want and how to get that 
um, that's a really great way to make sure that that information gets there. Great, thanks. Here's another question. Do you ever do, <clears throat> um, I don't know what to call them, ride-alongs sort of with, with FEMA or um, uh, any oh. other agencies? whether on the record or on background? I would highly recommend trying that. I did do that a few times. Um, sometimes when you're dealing with folks who are reservists, they don't necessarily want a reporter coming along on the record because they're afraid of losing their job and they're not authorized to speak to the media. But definitely try to cultivate those relationships and do that because that will give you a perspective on the ground that you may not get anywhere else. And it will help you see how things are really working. A lot of folks will be complaining because that's what they're really great at during a disaster. It's also them blowing off steam and trying to kind of come to terms with what's going on. But by going out with some of the the expert the, the workers in the in the field, um, you can kind of see how things are really progressing and understand how things are working. Um, but you do have to cultivate those relationships. Great. Um, there's. Uh, you you touched on the National Flood Insurance Program pretty briefly, and I under, I understand that that's a whole um, can of worms. But um, is there anything about the the National Flood Insurance Program that you wish someone had told you when you first started covering the aftermath of Sandy? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think I wish I had understood what flood maps were and how they worked and that the flood insurance rate maps, especially right now, they're going through a transition and that they're being updated. Um, and I believe a lot of states have what are referred to as preliminary maps, which means um, they're not technically the ones that are setting the flood rates. Um, but understanding how that transition happened and how that affected people and how that affected people's ability to rebuild and that you know, I, I think I and had, to, had to do that overnight one time, which just figure out how that was going to work. The flood, you know, there was going to be a big release the next day, and I had to understand what all of those little things meant. And what was really interesting for me was that it took me so long to figure it out, but then realizing how um, my readers were perceiving that, I kept getting emails saying, why don't you just publish the map in the paper? And my, my own editor actually even asked me that. And I said, well, you would probably need to run about a thousand more pages in the paper just for it to actually be visible. Um, and so they used to be on paper, the maps. They were on very large maps. And they would be in, in local building officials' offices or in the library. Uh, they're now digital. I'll, obviously, a lot of people don't have internet access, and they can't necessarily read something on, on the map, or their computer may not be able to handle it. Um, so, but just knowing what was coming on that regard um, and understanding how map, those maps worked and how they set, uh, how they actually set policy. And a lot of um, municipalities and, and states even will adopt the maps as a regulatory document and that's saying that, you know, you can build in this area and you can't build in this area or these are the requirements. But the challenge of the maps for that, they aren't necessarily intended to be that. They're intended to set flood insurance rates. Um, and then also that they don't incorporate future conditions. They only incorporate what has happened in the past. And so um, that could you, gives, so could you say that one more time? Because it was not super they, clear, and that's a they, really important point. They do not incorporate future conditions. They only <laughs> incorporate things that have happened in the past. <laughs> um, very important thing to know. Um, so sea level rise, for example, right. is not incorporated within the, the FEMA flood maps. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, a question came in as you were saying that. Um, this person says, apparently the flood maps in the Houston area were updated earlier this year. Any idea how long before those are incorporated into local planning? Um, I'm putting on my, my planner hat now. I do have a degree now in, in, in community or, or city and regional planning. Um, it is in my experience that planning takes a lot longer than maps and that, that than you think. And that um, obviously planning around flood, flood maps is a, a very contentious topic in, in a lot of areas because it puts restrictions on things that people don't want restrictions on. Um, so it could take a couple of years if it happens at all. Um, and it really, really will depend on uh, political will and and the act, you know, the, the way that the city or, or the, the, the entity wants to incorporate that. 
So um, I don't really have an answer for a specific number, but it may take a long time. And also, I think are they are the maps in Houston preliminary or are they are they final? I think they're still in the preliminary stage, so it may take even longer for that to actually happen. There's I know that um, here in Rhode Island, there's a, a program that has actually where the Coastal State Management Agency has been working with researchers at the University of Rhode Island to. Um, try to update maps and, and make them very accessible online mm -hmm. for planners, for lots of people. Do you know how much of that is happening around the country or is that not very common? Um, I don't really have an answer for that. I know that mm -hmm. FEMA, in, in my experience, just in terms of uh, you know, the last few months of me looking for a job, that FEMA is working with several groups to improve their risk communication as they're reaching out to communities on this. So um, I think that they're taking a lot of the lessons that they've learned over the last few years and incorporating that into the rollout process. So um, I don't know how, how that's going to look, um, but I know that they're probably interested in learning more. Um, but I don't know ultimately if, that, if they're going to go to the same level that, that Rhode Island does because you know, Rhode Island has a different, they have their own different ways of doing things. Okay. Um. Great. Um, I this maybe is uh, kind of jumping ahead to your next webinar, in which case say so. But um, um, what's still to come in recovery? What's the kind of what are the things for people to look out for? Uh, definitely jumping ahead. That's the next okay. webinar. Um, but you know, just very simply put, the long-term recovery process, and that's not going to start for. Um, you know, probably even a couple of months, to be honest, it does take a while to begin. And what you're going to start seeing as things get cleaned up and as people start getting settled a little bit into the new normal for now um, is that you're going to begin that process. And um, you'll have local organizations, local level long-term recovery groups forming. And FEMA comes in and provides a lot of assistance to help them figure out how to set that up and to move that forward so that they're providing that local level um, uh, outreach, if you will, to help understand what their challenges are and begin to use that to go forward. So that's kind of the next big thing once the cleanup is done. Great. Well, we'll uh, look forward to the next webinar to hear a lot more about that. Are there any last comments that you want to offer, uh, Sarah, on this? Um, just know that you're becoming a lifeline as a reporter and you don't know that yet. And that you may feel helpless in terms of just being able to, you know, you want to help with the, the disaster recovery process. Uh, but one of the most important things that you can do is actually provide information in a way that people understand. And you will, you're about to understand how important your job is and how much of a public service you provide. And I made a point to try to answer every single phone call and email and letter that came in because I quickly learned how many people did not understand what was going on and that if you can convey that information and be able to just explain that process and that bureaucracy, you will, be, you will be a lifeline to people. And also, if you do that, you will find an amazing resource for sources and for people to talk about you know, on the record because as they're contacting you, they realize that they don't want people to go through what they've just been through. And so they're more willing to actually talk on the record if you, you know, give them that compassion to understand what's going on. And so that becomes a really interesting relationship and it also helps you understand some of those individual stories that are going on. Um, and if you, you share those stories, other people will understand what's going on and that they may not feel as alone as they probably do. Great, that's fantastic. Next webinar again with Sarah will be this coming Friday, September 22nd. Once again, we'll do this at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and it, it'll be another half hour to 40 minute um, webinar, so hopefully um, a good timeline for you. And as we noted, she's going to talk a lot more about kind of the next phases of recovery after a major hurricane. Um, and I'd like to note that there is a very, very short survey you can take. You can access this survey link from uh, the, the um, main page um, when you clicked on the link to join the webinar. There's a, a short survey link there. Um, we'd love to get your input on this webinar and also others, um, and there's an opportunity for you to join our, our e-newsletter list, et cetera, while you're there. 
Thank you very much, Sarah Watson. Um, we really appreciate your time. We look forward to um, hearing from more of you this coming Friday. Bye-bye.